We're going to talk about MLOps today. I'm going to skip my introduction. You just heard about Covaris and me. I've been building and testing software for 35 years. That means I'm old too. I uh, do a lot of writing and speaking about Agile and DevOps at conferences and do a lot of blogging, things like that. I've run a couple of consulting companies. We already heard about Covaris, so I'll skip the Covaris introduction. For those of you that haven't done a lot of machine learning, let me give you kind of a brief overview of kind of how you think about um, designing, developing, testing, and deploying and monitoring machine learning uh, models. And really, it's, it's a six to eight to 10 step, I always say eight plus or minus two step process that you're going to go through as a team to design out and ultimately put into production and monitor a machine learning application. Uh, you're going to start, step one really is to go out and figure out what data out there is information that I'm expecting to see that I need to process, analyze, and come up with some sort of a prediction around in the machine learning model that I'm going to build. So usually this step is done by data scientists, data engineers, people who you know, live, eat, and breathe data. Um, that could be internal data. It could be customer data that you're collecting and you want to analyze and do something with. It could be external data. Maybe it's out there in the cloud. Maybe it's um, image databases or natural language databases. Uh, or it could be real-time feeds from you know, stock market or weather APIs or anything else out there. It really depends on what your app is. But your goal is to figure out what are the data sources that I'm going to have to uh, and I expect to see in production so that I can train a model to make predictions against that data. That's kind of step one. Step two is that data is usually not in a form you can use it. It doesn't fit your inputs or what your model's expecting based on the machine learning model that you're thinking about implementing or experimenting with. And so you're going to have to do some amount of data analysis on it. One popular approach in the data science community is called exploratory data analysis. It's really to understand the data, figure out what aspects of the data that you're looking at is relevant to your problem space and what you're trying to do with machine learning. Um, and then after you've done that, you want to engineer features. And what that means really is trying to figure out how to put the data in the format that your models can read it and use it as input so you can train against that data, and then in production, when that type of data shows up, read it, leverage it, and do whatever it is your model's looking to do in production. After you have our data, we have our data set up, then we're gonna get into what we call model training. Some people call this experimentation. This is where we look at different machine learning models. We look at different parameters for those models. We look at different what we call hyperparameters, which are um, how fast we want to try to learn and how fast we want the model to, to um, hopefully get to the point where it's accurate. Um, and we're going to train that. After we train, we're going to evaluate how well the model works. And this means we're going to give it some data it hasn't seen before and we're gonna see how well it does at actually uh, predicting whatever it is our business case is for our machine learning model. After we validated the model, we wanna serve it up and deploy it. We wanna get it out into production, make sure it works. We wanna test it. We wanna get it all ready and get it out into whatever our production environment might be. That could be um, uh, an API that gets called by other applications, could be a service in a microservices architecture, it could be part of a website, could be part of one of your existing apps, whatever it is, uh, we need to get it out into production. And then we want to monitor uh, that model in production. Here's what it looks like graphically, what I just described, you know, basically from our data sources through data analysis and engineering into our model training. We're going to have different model data sets that we're going to use as part of our training. I'll explain that um, uh, in a bit and why we have different sets. Where we evaluate, validate, serve the model, move it into production, and then monitor the, the model in production. Now, I like to break these eight steps apart into different aspects and areas that I think from a deployment and a delivery perspective are different aspects of the problem. The first one is this I call data and feature engineering. 
process. And as mentioned earlier, that's usually done by data scientists and machine uh, learning engineers working together to get their data in the right format for our particular use. The second one is really our training and validation step. It's to figure out what model makes sense, what parameters of those models, figure out what the most accurate approach is for whatever our machine learning application is. The third piece is our, you know, it's really our deployment process, right? It's testing integration and deployment of our models so that we can push them into production. And then last but not least, it's our model operations and our moni uh, monitoring that we're gonna do as our model is in production, doing things that we're looking for it to do from a business perspective. It looks pretty easy, right? I mean, you know, eight steps, plus or minus two, pretty structured, nice, pretty graph, pretty flow. Yeah, it's easy, all right. Uh, Matt Turk, if you follow Matt Turk on Twitter or elsewhere, he's a VC in this space, um, early stage venture capitalist. He also, though, does a lot of writing on machine learning and AI, and he was like, yeah, it's easy to do data in IA. All, AI, all you have to do is all these acronyms, right? Um, nice pithy tweet from Matt. It's not easy to do, right? This is not as simple as it looks. There's four challenges that I think are the most important four things to, to solve as part of the machine learning process that as we're gonna talk, I think MLOps, this concept I'm gonna introduce, um, helps you with. So the first one is that this entire process we follow to design, develop, test, and deliver machine learning models into production has to be reproducible. All right, why? Why does it need to be re reproducible? Well, there's really two key reasons. The first is governance. All right, you're, you're already starting to hear people are questioning, well, how do we know that these models, this AI stuff, is giving us accurate, unbiased, fair, useful information? Like, how do we know? And I believe as machine learning models become more and more prevalent in our organizations, those questions are gonna get answered, asked more and more by regulators, by federal agencies, um, by internal audit, by other companies. We're going to have to be able to demonstrate how we came up with the model that we put into production that's making predictions or doing some activity. And the only way we can do that is if we can reproduce it. So we can show it again, right? Models are different than our traditional software development, right? If we wanna demonstrate that software development, you know, meets the needs of customers, we just say, well, here's its requirements, here's its test, trace those things, run test and demonstrate it does what it's supposed to do. Not so easy in machine learning. When the software is this machine learning model that you've built up and trained based on data. You have to demonstrate that the data was fair and unbiased. You have to demonstrate that the model worked as is approved and appropriate and that all that together works in a way that's unbiased and fair and gives you good results. And the only way you can do that is if you can reproduce the model and how you generated it and created it during the process. The second big problem you have is that you need accuracy in this model, right? And you say, well, no duh, right? That's why we try to find a model and parameters and data that give us some indication as to how accurate the predictions are gonna be that it makes. But there's a big problem. Have you heard of data skew in production? Models degrade. Machine learning models degrade in production, which when I first heard this, I was like, I'm not getting it, right? I'm a software guy, once again. Software doesn't degrade. We either screwed it up or we didn't, right? Well, the challenge though is that data changes over time. And so for a lot of our models that are reading in data, as that data that it's getting from the real world changes, sometimes it impacts the accuracy of our model. It might be because now the input is is structured differently and our model isn't prepared to um, handle that. Maybe it's even like an image, the fidelity of images in a database has changed 
and somehow that's impacting our ability to pick out the features or whatever it is that we're keying on to make predictions. Um, so that could be happening. The other thing is that data is shifting and changing, right? Let's say your application is a, I wanna predict the price of cars on the used car market in each you know, place around the world, right? That data that we trained it with was based on some sample of the past X weeks, months, however the time period is, and the snapshot in time right now, it's probably a very accurate model. But as pricing changes, right, COVID hits, the price of automobiles radically changed. All of a sudden, all of our predictive models go out the window when all of the new data that's showing up is different than all the old data we saw before. So we are gonna have to figure out how do we keep our models that are in production accurate over time. We'll talk about how you do that in a bit. The third is key components in this process. These boxes, right? These four kind of major areas of our process. We would like to reuse them, right? Why, we, why do we want to do this? Well, Bill Gates was quoted recently saying that machine learning and AI and what's happening out there with generative AI, large language models, transformers, you know, everybody here is, I'm sure, played around with GPT, chat GPT, all this stuff that's happening, he said is gonna impact our business world as much as the internet and the World Wide Web did to the businesses in the 90s. He knows a little bit about software, so I'm guessing he's at least partially right, right? But what this means for all of you is, as you start to integrate machine learning and models into your applications across your business, you're gonna to wanna to do that smartly. You're gonna to wanna to do that in a way that if you come up with a way to take data and transform it and build it into something you can use in one model, if you have other models in your organization that have similar inputs, you'd like to reuse that information, right? If you have a training process that works, an environment that you like and it works, or a deployment process, your CI-CD process that works for one model, you'd certainly like to figure out how to reuse those models in other places in your org that's using machine learning. So we want ultimately our processes that we follow to be reusable. And last but not least, as we figure out what model makes the most sense, what model's most accurate with what parameters and what hyperparameters and learning parameters, we wanna keep track of that whole experimentation process, that process of looking at different models their structure, their parameters, so that we don't, one is so that we remember what we did, reproducibility again, but two is it's just gonna speed up our analysis if we're keeping track of everything that's going on as we're iteratively trying new things. I can tell you I've made this mistake when I first started building machine learning models and messing around with some of this stuff. I would do experiments, I would try things, and oh, that got, you know, the results are better, oh, this time it's worse, better, worse, good, better, and then at some point I was like, okay, I've done enough, I got one I like, now which one was that? Like, I'd be digging back through my experimental runs, and what did I name it, what did I call it, I couldn't remember, it was all because I, I had no structured way to track the experimentation I was doing, so that in the end, end, I knew exactly what the model and the parameters were that were the most successful in that experimentation process. All right, so to me, these are the big four business challenges that you're gonna run into as you start to try to build machine learning models. Making them reproducible, making sure they continue to stay accurate, making sure your process is reusable, so others can use it and making sure that all the experimentation you do is trackable. And this is where MLOps comes in, in my opinion. Now, when I first heard this term MLOps, I was like, you know, I've been in the DevOps space forever and every day somebody comes up with some new twist on the portmanteau DevOps, right? AI ops, you know, this ops, that ops, chat ops, this ops, every time. And I saw MLOps, I was like, oh my God, another one, not another one, right? But after I started working with machine learning models a little bit, I started to understand that there is actually some nuances. And that's what we're gonna talk about for the second half of this talk, 
is some nuances that are specific to machine learning and to having this data component that's a driver for the training and experimentation we do and then the prediction that we do in production that does add some characteristics and some tooling and some automation that's a little different than we historically in DevOps have needed. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So I always say MLOps, you know, definition looks a lot like DevOps, right? It's, it's a set of cultural and engineering practices that's trying to unify the development side of machine learning, uh, you know, the modeling and data analysis that we're doing up front with the operational side of having our models in production and keeping them accurate by monitoring them. It's really what MLOps is. And I kind of see MLOps um, kind of um, skill sets being a combination of three different characteristics, right? You've got definitely a DevOps component in here. As you see, there's a heavy dose of CI, CD and kind of DevOps thinking, cross-functional thinking, making sure data scientists aren't in a little box over in the corner, but they're actually part of the whole process, right? Because there's a role for them in the whole process. You know the drill. You all are DevOps people. So there's a strong DevOps piece. There's certainly a software engineering piece. As soon as you start talking about reuse, reproducibility, you know, those kinds of things, you start thinking about software engineering best practices and ways to structure things so that you track and maintain them and version them and keep, you know, keep tabs on everything going on through the whole process. And then last but not least, there's a data science, data engineering component here. You know, making sure that the data is formatted right, that you found the right data, that you're keeping track and making sure that data as it skews, you are updating your models. So those are kind of the, the skill sets, I think, that are important if you're gonna do you know, what, what I call ML ops. So what are the unique things or the stuff that is different about ML ops? You know, based on what I just described these problems are. Well, well I know there's at least five, there's probably more, but these are five that I've kind of keyed in on, on my work and, and some of the, the work I've done to try to figure out how to best, you know, deploy ML ops models and meet these business challenges. And we're gonna talk about each of these a little bit more in some of the future slides, but just to introduce them. The first is um, my overall flow of the process. Those eight steps I showed and the process, you know, as we all know, there's no one set of steps or process in a DevOps process that's gonna work for each of our applications, each of our situations. It's very context specific. Same with ML ops. But you do need some sort of a structure, uh, an overall end-to-end -end workflow for your you know, end-to-end -end machine learning process. So that's something we gotta come up with. Second is what's called a feature store. Uh, a feature store, when I first heard the term, it just sounded like a fancy name for a database to me. I was like, all right, they're just giving it some new name. It's just a database. It's gotta be just a database. Well, it sort of is. It is a data store. But what's stored in a feature store is more than just the data sets that you've come up with for a particular model. It's actually uh, the information that defines how you transfer or you um, translate or transform data from its raw form into the features and the inputs that your model's gonna need. We store those transformations in addition to the output of those transformations and in addition to links to the additional, the raw information because we'd like a feature store to allow us to share our data with the rest of the organization and have them be able to reuse it. So it provides a reusable and reproducible data feature engineering process that I didn't have if I'm just transforming some raw data, saving it and then version controlling what I have and not caring how I got there, right? I, I want that reproducibility of how did I get from the raw data to what I used in this model so I can show reproducibility but also make sure that others can use it. Third one is large data set version control. And um, we'll talk about why that's important and why we can't just use Git, right? Like what? I hear that all the time. Just use Git, right? Everybody uses Git. I'll talk about that for a second. Experiment tracking, we talked a little bit about keeping track of what we did, why we did what we did. Uh, we want to be able to deal with that. And then last but not least, kind of like artifact repositories in our traditional DevOps process, 
we need a way to keep track of the models that come out of this experimentation process and we move toward production or into production um, because we want to make sure we understand what's out in production, what's available, and we have tagged and version controlled everything, including the data, including the parameters, including the meta description of the runs and experiments we did. We want everything to be in that repository, that registry, um, again, so we know what's in each release, um, not just in the code, but in the data, all right? Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about tools, and every time I talk about tools, there's always some of the audience afterwards that comes up and says, you didn't mention my tool. My tool wasn't on the list. Well, so I got a good slide here. <laughs> um, it's another slide from Matt Turk. It's his machine learning tool landscape. I know it's a little hard to read, but I assure you, your tool is on this map, because I looked at it, and there's a lot of tools on this map. Seriously, though, if you go to this URL, there is a, obviously, a bigger version of this tool map, but also it's um, interactive. So you can click on any of the logos. It'll tell you the company, the website, a little bit about the tool. It's actually it was a heck of a piece of work. Um, so if you want to look at the tools, and each of these are different aspects and capabilities, right, across the entire landscape, check it out, all right? I'm not going to talk about all these tools. For the most part, I'm going to talk, when I talk about these different kind of unique um, these unique ML ops needs. I'm going to talk mostly about open source solutions. There, I'll, I'll mention some of the commercial tools as well, but if you want to get started and try some of the open source stuff, it's an easy way to get going, right? All right, the first one, our overall end-to-end -end kind of project workflow for our entire um, ML ops and, and ML process across feature engineering, our training, our deployment, and our monitoring. All right, here's some tools for you to think about and consider. On the commercial side, all the big dogs, all the cloud providers have end-to-end, soup-to-nuts, machine learning project workflow tools. All right, Vertex, that's Google Cloud, obviously Azure is Microsoft, Amazon's AWS, or I mean SageMaker is AWS. Um, so, and, and they're all kind of used by the drink, you know, very cloud-ish pricing structures, right? But they have a nice, end-to-end -end set of tools um, if you want to pay for them. Uh, I also mentioned weights and biases because they come up a lot in discussions. I haven't personally used the tool. Uh, someone I know very well, my son who runs an ML company, they use weights and biases. He swears by this product. It's commercial product though, so you got to pay for it, right? So these are kind of end-to-end project workflow tools. They allow you to create directed acyclic graphs of your flow of information track your information, and then they have specific tools that help with each step in the different business challenges that I mentioned earlier. Now, over on the open source uh, side of things, you've got some great tools as well, and I do encourage you to check them out. Airflow came out of Airbnb. It's their tool for kind of end-to-end -end workflow analysis. Nice, works well, often coupled with MLflow. Uh, MLflow came out of Databricks, I believe it was, and it is really popular for particular pieces in this process. You're going to see it again in um, future slides, but if you combine Airflow and MLflow together, they make a really nice end-to-end -end package for project workflow and the individual activities that we're going to talk about. Uh, Metaflow came out of Netflix. Great tool. Um, they also have some other tools around them given to the community. Kubeflow, if you're orchestrating and deploying and leveraging Kubernetes, I know, shout out, right, yesterday's group, Kubernetes group, Kubeflow might be for you. It's open source, came out of Google, and it basically allows you to um, track machine learning projects and leverage Kubernetes in the orchestration and the deployment of those machine learning projects seamlessly and easily. So I would recommend if you're a Kubernetes fan, try Kubeflow. If you're not using Kubernetes, you might try a combination of Airflow and MLflow or Metaflow if you just, you just like to watch Netflix and you think they're cool. I don't know. All right, second one. The feature and data engineering piece, that upfront analysis of your data. 
There's standard data analysis tools I'm not going to talk about because they don't really have anything to do with ML ops. But the kinds of tools you're going to see are data analysis tools like Pandas and feature tools like Feature Tools and TS Fresh that help you structure your data, figure out your features, define your data streams, things like that. Um, when you're ready, a feature store, as I mentioned, as a way to re start reusing your data and your data stores and tracking the reproducibility of how you got to your data sets. There's two nice products out there. There's others, um, Hopsworks and Feast. Feast is completely open source. So I, if you're open source, you know, lean that way. Start with Feast. Hopsworks uh, is a commercial product. They do have a freemium model. So there's some stuff you can use for free to try it out. Check out one of those if you're interested in feature stores. As I mentioned out here, though, I don't recommend starting with a feature store, personally, until your organization, organization starts to try to reuse data sets and reuse information, because now you've figured out, you know, product over product, how to do different things with your machine learning models using the same data sets or data types. You don't really need a feature store, in my opinion. It's too much overhead for not enough um, kind of squeeze, if you will. Now, when you get it into model training and validation, many of you have probably heard of Jupyter. It's a very popular, collaborative, cloud, often cloud-based experimentation model for very rapidly um, trying models and parameters and collecting information and grafting things, et cetera, et cetera. It's very popular in the data science community to do experimentation around machine learning models. Um, the challenge with Jupyter is a couple things. One is it's a collaborative environment, and that's good, but it's also not version controlled very well. So you can make changes in one place, not rerun them, and then the graphs underneath in your notebook will not match what's above it. And you might not know that because you just didn't rerun your analysis. Um, also, there's a big debate about should you just, if you build experiments and you come up with a model in Jupyter, can't you just like deploy your Jupyter notebook and just run it in production? There are people that do this, by the way. They use this experimentation environment and then they deploy their models in Jupyter into their production environment. I don't recommend that. One is you got reproducibility issues, as I mentioned. Version control isn't done very well. Et cetera, et cetera. Now, Netflix tries to help this because Netflix actually has deployed some machine learning models into production. They built this product called Paper Mill, sits on top of Jupyter, and basically tries to let you parameterize your notebook so you can better isolate and separate them in more of a software engineering manner. So there's a little more structure to it. Uh, but I don't recommend you do that. What I recommend you do is take what's in your experimentation um, environment and whatever model and parameters and check it into source code control, get it under control, and, and then move forward with the, the code that you pulled out of your notebook as the model um, to build the model and run the model, et cetera, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> one challenge with GitHub and GitLab and Git in general is it doesn't do very good at efficiently storing large data models. So, you, you can use Git to version control your data sets and your large data models that you've built, but it's going to eat up a lot of space. It was not built to do that. There is a plugin on top of Git called DVC, Data Version Control, which is optimized for storing and maintaining versions of large data sets along with Git in an efficient way that doesn't just eat up storage. Recommend you check out that. Uh, experiment tracking, I mentioned just keeping track of all these experiments that you're doing in your notebooks and everything. You know, MLflow, Metaflow, weights and biases, they all integrate into things like Jupyter and allow you to basically seamlessly keep track of your experiments, keep track of which ones produce which results, so you can then, you know which model is the right model to move forward into your um, process. When you get into, now you have something you like and you're now moving it into deployment. Um, I call it the model you know, test integration and deployment process. You're gonna see a lot of friendly faces here because this aspect is really straight old, nice, 
familiar CI/CD, right? We're going to do things on pull requests. We're going to do things when things get checked in. If you like containerization and orchestration, you might put everything in Docker and use Kubernetes. You might use PyTest or other testing facilities. All this stuff's going to look familiar to you all. We're going to use the same tools because once you have your model in as code and your data versioned, you can just treat it like an application at this point. The only difference is once we have something that we push into QA and integration and out into production for our models, we're going to want to track in this registry what those models are and what the meta parameters are associated with this model. And MLflow does that really well, so does weights and biases. That's really the only difference we need to do here. right? Now, one thing I didn't mention that's important is deploying models versus deploying code. So when I first started building these models, I would just find the right model, get it to work, and I would just push it out. I would test it some, I'd push it out into production. I was pushing the model itself out through my CI CD process. The problem with that is I really don't, I wanna make sure that what I've been experimenting on and I've done, and now I've moved it out of the experimental environment into a new environment, we all know when we change environments, there's risk, right? And so what I really want to do is I want to check in all the code. I want to rebuild the model in QA and staging and rerun it on the same data and make sure it still gives me the same predictions. And so I want to deliver and deploy code not this model that came out of experimentation, because I want to retest it, I want to verify it, I want to be able to reproduce it. And by the way, there are some models that you um, might even test in production for certain situations. If you're doing real-time streaming and you're trying to make sure your, your, your model's staying accurate, you might need to do real-time retesting and retraining, and that means you have to have a full model in production. Last slide, and then we're going to call it a day. I see I'm just about out of time. When you get into operations, there's some standard application monitoring software you probably already use. No reason you can't use that to monitor your apps. But you also want to monitor the model itself to make sure that the quality of the results is still there. And there's some specialized tools. Two of them are open source, Great Expectations, and Mobi. Um, this is a family friendly crowd, so I call this Mobi DQ. It is a whale, so you can guess what you could also call it, but they are um, you know, great tools for um, evaluating the quality of your model and watching for it to, watching for degradation. And that's why it is still very common for a human, a data scientist, to be in the loop, looking at the, the measures and the metrics to decide whether you know, the model is slipping or, or maintaining itself. So just as a last slide, I've added in the capabilities that I just showed you. Um, you'll have access to these slides, but now you've got a feature store in the mix. We are now version controlling everything, packaging it up. We are then rebuilding and retesting and verifying when we get into QA and staging, registering models so we keep track of their version, and then triggering quality issues. Incidentally, if you find a quality issue, you ought to set up a, 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 a loop that first goes through and tries to tune your existing model. Now that's called continuous retraining. Um, if it turns out your model now just isn't good for the data you have, you might have to go back up to experimentation and start all over. In fact, this is why they always say uh, machine learning isn't a one-shot deal. You don't build a model and then just forget about it. Your data scientist should be constantly looking for better models, looking at data and how it's changing and trying to improve things. So with that, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be around all day and, and tomorrow. We'd be happy to chat about MLOps if you want. Thank you.